Hi again, this is Andy, K4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisper and Lesson 33 in the General Class Operator Element 3 exam course. In this lesson, we covered the G9D questions. All right, the G9D section of questions basically just covers some specialized antennas. And there's two antennas that you're going to need to know for this section. That's the log periodic antenna and the beverage antenna. In addition to that, there's some information about multiband antennas as well as some information about how to get the propagation you want out of your antenna as far as like height above the ground and whatnot. So with that said, let's get started with the review. What does the term NVIS mean as related to antennas? NVIS stands for Near Vertical Incident Sky Wave. And NVIS is usually associated with horizontally polarized antennas like dipoles and is basically a trick so that you can get shorter skipping distances out of a horizontally polarized dipole. Now NVIS antennas are normally less than a quarter wavelength above the ground and more than one tenth of a wavelength above the ground. Now this interaction between the horizontally polarized antenna or the dipole and the close proximity to the ground, what it does is that it puts the radiation pattern so that the signal that the antenna is generating is more vertically oriented than it is horizontally. So instead of shooting out of the sides, it kind of shoots it at a more upward angle. The effect this has is that it bounces the signal off the ionosphere at a shorter distance and gives you a closer skip contact than you normally would get from a half wavelength dipole that's at least a half wavelength above the earth. So essentially it shortens the skip distance, NVIS shortens the skip distance of a horizontally polarized dipole. But for this question, all you need to know is NVIS stands for Near Vertical Incident Sky Wave. Which of the following is an advantage of an NVIS antenna? The answer is high vertical angle radiation for short skip during the day. Now the signal strength of an NVIS antenna, and this is what we were talking about in the last question, but the signal strength of an NVIS antenna is more vertical than a similar antenna at a half wavelength above the ground. So this allows for skip contacts closer to the transmitting station than an antenna whose radiation pattern is more parallel or horizontal to the ground. So like we were talking about in the previous question, the end effect is, is that this high, rate, high vertical angle of radiation basically shortens the skip distance for a NVIS antenna. At what height above ground is an NVIS antenna typically installed? Well, an NVIS antenna is typically installed between one-tenth and one-quarter wavelength above the ground. And like we are talking about in, uh, um, th this is a characteristic of NVIS antennas, and we were talking about in the previous questions, is that this short distance above the ground interacts, when you transmit a signal, it interacts with the ground in a way that it increases the vertical radiation pattern of the antenna and thus gives you a shorter skip distance. How does the gain of two three-element horizontally polarized Yagi antennas spaced vertically one-half wave apart from each other typically compare to the gain of a single three-element Yagi? The answer, and you're going to need to memorize this, is it's approximately three decibels higher. Now, this stacking of uh, Yagi antennas on top of each other is a technique referred to as stacking Yagis, which makes sense. Now, by combining the power of the two Yagis, the gain is re that's received is approximately three decibels higher than just a single Yagi. So, like I said, this is a number you're going to need to memorize. But by stacking two Yagis about a half wavelength apart, um, you're going to get a gain that's approximately three decibels higher. What is the advantage of vertical stacking of horizontally polarized Yagi antennas? The answer is it narrows the main lobe in elevation. And we talked about the radiation pattern of Yagis a little bit in the last lesson. If you think of a Yagi antenna as a lens, and that lens is focusing a radio signal onto the driven element, two stacked Yagis further focus the signal to the driven element. And when these two Yagis are working together, essentially what it does is it makes a directional antenna even more directional. So that main lobe in the radiation pattern of a single Yagi becomes even more pointed when the Yagis are stacked vertically. And like I said, this has the impact of making the antennas even more directional. So this question is referring to the, the radiation pattern of the two vertical stacked Yagis. And that radio, radi radiation pattern is narrowed even more in the main lobe 
with two vertical stacked Yagis. Which of the following is an advantage of a log periodic antenna? The answer is wide bandwidth. Now, a, a log periodic antenna looks a lot like a Yagi, except the construction is a little bit different. So it has a similar shape, however, it's electronically different. And a log periodic antenna can be a multiband antenna. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but it can be a, a multiband antenna. So a log periodic antenna is essentially a series of dipoles on a beam. And the longest dipole or element is one half wavelength of the lowest operating frequency you want to use. And that's at the back of the dipole, or excuse me, the back of the beam. As the elements move forward along the beam, each element or array becomes shorter and the spacing between them becomes less and less per a, a logarithmic formula. Now the result looks like an arrow pointing in the direction of the strongest radiation pattern. So it, it looks like an arrow pointing in the direction you want to transmit. Now each element or dipole is connected to each other electronically. So the advantage this has over Yagi is that it allows a much larger spectrum of frequencies to be received by the log periodic antenna without a large increase in impedance. So essentially, a series of dipoles can catch and radiate a wide range of frequencies as compared to a Yagi, which is a focused around the specific frequency that the driven element is cut to or the frequency the antenna is already tuned to. So where you might have a Yagi that just works on one band, a log periodic antenna can work on multiple bands or a wide range of frequencies. Which of the following describes a log periodic antenna? Well, the answer they're looking for is length and spacing of the elements increases logarithmically from one end of the boom to the other. So, and this is describing a log periodic antenna from the shortest element at the front, so the direction you want to transmit in, to the back of the antenna, which is the element that's cut to one half wavelength of the lowest frequency you want to work on. Now the elements along a, a log periodic antenna from the shortest element to the longest increases in length and as well as the space between the elements. So the distance between the first two elements is short, the distance between the last two elements is much longer. Now there is a logarithmic formula which determines the length and spacing of the elements that you don't need to know for the exam, but knowing that there's a logarithmic formula to get this kind of describe it's the log in log periodic antenna. So a log the would the answer that best describes a log periodic antenna is the length and spacing of the elements increases logarithmically from one end of the boom to the other. Why is a beverage antenna generally not used for transmitting? The answer is a beverage antenna has high losses compared to other types of antennas. Now, a beverage antenna is basically just an extremely long wire, and it can be as long as two wavelengths and is generally very low to the ground. Now, they're great for shortwave listening, especially on low HF bands or low frequency bands, but they're lousy for transmitting. And there's a, a lot of signal loss. You have to need a lot of energy to get a good signal out of them, and they're basically just inconvenient. One of the reasons they're inconvenient is that they're so freaking long. Unless you own a ranch and have acres upon acres of land, um, you're not going to have enough room for a beverage antenna on most frequencies, or at least to getting good out of it. However, the beverage antenna is lousy for transmitting. It's great for directional receiving. And the reason it's bad for transmitting is that it has high losses compared to other types of antennas. Which of the following is an application for a beverage antenna? The app, like we were talking about in the previous question, the, an application for a beverage antenna is a directional receiving for low HF bands. Now, beverage antennas, which are named after the inventor and have no relationship to anything like a beverage can or anything convenient like that, are great for low frequency directional receiving. And keep in mind, when I was saying that these things are extremely long, that a beverage antenna for 160 meters can almost be a mile long. So when you see beverage antenna, think low frequency directional receiving. This is not a, a good transmitting antenna. It's just good for low HF band directional receiving. Which of the following describes a beverage antenna? Well, the possible answer is the best one is a very long and low receiving antenna that is highly directional. And this pretty much just sums up all the information we went over on beverage antennas. They're very long, they're relatively low to the ground compared to other antennas, and they're generally used for receiving and they're very, very, very directional. Which of the following is a disadvantage of multi-band antennas? 
Well, multiband antennas have poor harmonic rejection. Multiband antennas are essentially what they say they are. They're antennas that work on multiple bands. Now, the problem with multiband multi -band antennas is they work best when the bands are harmonics of each other. So if you um, have a, a, multi, a common multiband antenna would work on 10 meters, 20 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters, that type of relationship. So that the frequencies that the multiband antenna will cover are essentially harmonics of each other. Now the problem is, is that the, if you have an antenna and you're trying to pick up a signal on 10 meters, your antenna is also picking up signals on 20 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters, etc. And it has a hard time rejecting um, those harmonics to the frequency that you want to look for. So essentially it can cause a lot of inf interference on those harmonic bands. So one disadvantage of a multiband antenna is that they have poor harmonic rejection. What is the primary purpose of traps installed in antennas? Well, the primary purpose is to permit multiband operation. Now, traps are basically just electrical circuits which trap signals along the antenna, and they keep the signals in its resonant portion of the antenna. So, essentially, if you want to, if you have a multiband antenna and you're trying to um, transmit and receive on 10 meters, a trap will keep the signal on the 10 meter portion of the multiband antenna and not let it bleed over into the 20 meter, the 40 meter lengths of the antenna and thus keep your SWR low and everything else good. Now traps are LC networks. They're placed at specific points along the antenna. And based on a signal's frequency, the trap is tuned to either stop the signal and keep it in the portion of the antenna that that signal is tuned for, for instance the 10 meter portion, or if you're trying to broadcast on, or excuse me, transmit on 20 meters, it'll let it pass to the, a trap will let it pass to the next portion so it'll transmit on the 20 meter length of the antenna and keep it from going to like the 40 or the 80 meter length. So a trap is essentially an LC network that permits multiband operation when it's installed on an antenna. And that is the end of the G9D review and it is time for the G9D quiz. So take out that pencil and piece of paper and number 1 through 12. I'll be going through the questions pretty quickly so if you need more time just pause the video and take all the time you need. When you're done with the quiz, be sure to stop by hamwhisper.com and check your answers. They'll be found under the exam answers page under the G9D section. And with that said, let's get started with the quiz. Question 1. What does the term NBIS mean as related to antennas? A. Nearly vertical inducted system. B. Non-visible installation specification. C. Non-varying impedance smoothing or D, near vertical incident sky wave. Question two, which of the following is an advantage of an NVIS antenna? A, low vertical angle radiation for DX work. B, high vertical angle radiation for short skip during the day. C, high forward gain. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Question three, at what height above ground is an NVIS antenna typically installed? A, as close to one half wave as possible. B, as close to one wavelength as possible. C, height is not critical as long as significantly more than one half wavelength. D, between one tenth and one quarter wavelength. Question four. How does the gain of two three element horizontally polarized Yagi antennas spaced vertically one half wave apart from each other typically compare to the gain of a single three element Yagi? A, approximately 1.5 decibels higher, B, approximately 3 decibels higher, C, approximately 6 decibels higher, or D, approximately 9 decibels higher. Question 5. What is the advantage of vertical stacking of horizontally polarized Yagi antennas? A, allows quick selection of vertical or horizontal polarization, B, allows simultaneous vertical and horizontal polarization, C, narrows the main lobe in azimuth. D, narrows the main lobe in elevation. Question six, which of the following is an advantage of a log periodic antenna? A, wide bandwidth. B, higher gain per element than a Yagi antenna. C, harmonic suppression. Or D, polarization diversity. Question seven, which of the following describes log periodic antenna? A, 
length and spacing of the elements increases logarithmically from one end of the boom to the other. B, impedance varies periodically as a function of frequency. C, gain varies lo logarithmically as a function of frequency. Or D, SWR varies periodically as a function of boom length. Question 8. Why is a beverage antenna generally not used for transmitting? A. Its impedance is too low for effective matching. B. It has high losses compared to other types of antennas. C. It has poor directivity. Or D. All of these choices are correct. Question 9. Which of the following is an application for a beverage antenna? A. Directional transmitting for low HF bands. B. Directional receiving for low HF bands. C. Portable direction finding at higher HF frequencies or D. Portable direction finding at lower HF frequencies. Question 10. Which of the following describes a beverage antenna? A. A vertical antenna constructed from beverage cans. B. A broadband mobile antenna. C. A helical antenna for space reception. Or D. A very long and low receiving antenna that is highly directional. Question 11. Which of the following is a disadvantage of multiband antennas? A. They present low impedance on all design frequencies. B. They must be used with an antenna tuner. C. They must be fed with open wire line. Or D. They have poor harmonic rejection. Question 12. What is the primary purpose of traps installed in antennas? A. To permit multiband operation. B. To notch spurious frequencies. C. To provide balanced feed point impedance. Or D. To prevent out of band operation. And that's it for the quiz and lesson 33. So now that you're done with the quiz, stop by hamwhisper.com to check your answers. You can find them under the exam answers page under the G9D section. So until next time in lesson 34, this is Andy, KE4GKP, saying 73, and I hope to hear you on the air soon.